Right, my name is um, Peter Schwanepoel. I'm a researcher and a, um, at Salamosh University. Um, I'm a soil scientist and an agronomist, so um, I'm mainly going to talk about uh, from, a, from a, an agricultural point of view. And the, the, the title of the talk is Soil Quality of Pasture and um, Crop Rotation Systems in South Africa. Right, so South Africa is a, it's a beautiful country. It's very diverse in terms of climate, um, in terms of soil, animals, ecology, um, people. And um, in this, this is a rainfall map, which just shows how diverse the climate or the rainfall is as well. Decrease in the, in the west from about 100 millimeters per year to more than 1,000 millimeters um, in, the, in the east. So I'm from, from the Western Cape province. Um, down, down here, Salamosh University is down close to Cape Town in the corner here, and I'm going to um, focus on 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 the farming systems, pasture and crop rotation systems in the in the in the, in the Western Cape province. So to zoom in, um, this map shows the different f um, land use practices, and the pink indicates dry land and um, field cropping, and the green towards the other end is pasture. Uh, in cultivate the partial or improved grasslands. So the first area, which is um, a distinct area, is called the swat plant. It is um, a f mainly crop rotation with um, f wheat and uh, barley and, and oats and small grains. It's uh, at, as a typical Mediterranean type climate, and the rainfall distribution is very poor. It receives about 80% of its rainfall during, um, during the cool months. And the annual rainfall is, an, is around 400 millimeters. In the Southern Cape, also is a typical Mediterranean climate, but it's, the distribution is a bit better. Um, it receives about 65 to 70% of its rainfall during the cool months, and it's, the rainfall, annual rainfall is also a bit higher, at about 500 uh, millimeters per year. And then I'm also going to talk about the Parshas region, this is um, the climate is a bit different. It's also part of the Southern Cape region, but it um, it is a as a temperate climate, and the rainfall distribution is more or less distributed throughout the year. But generally, the soils of this region are um, very shallow, about two hundred millimeters deep, and very rocky, and highly variable within meters. So it makes management very difficult. <coughs> The natural soil fertility is usually low to moderate, but in South Africa, people usually tend to take soil tests regularly, at least annually, and correct um, according to the soil test. So um, it has been improved through time. To give you the, an, an idea of what the soils look like in the Svartland region, the virgin soil, um, which has been undisturbed, has a carbon content of about 1.8%. And cultivated land in that area range between 0.2 and 1.2, so it's very low carbon content. In the southern Cape, where the rainfall distribution is a bit better and there is a high rainfall, virgin soil usually have around a carbon content of about 3%. Cultivated land between 1 and 2.5% carbon, and pastures are usually in the ex excess of 3.5% uh, carbon. Now the, the history of these system ha systems have a significant impact of what problems, the problems that we experience today and how, 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 how these systems evolve. Um, a, there are, there's a number of concerns um, coming from, from the conventional tillage that used to be the norm. So in the, for pastures and the crop rotation systems, annual crops were usually planted by means of cult uh, conventional tillage. Occasionally today you'll still find a farmer here and there that still till the soil and this is a typical picture and what it looks like and it's, it can't be good for soil quality and sustainability. There's nothing on the soil um, that protects the soil from the sunlight, it can be very hot and very dry in summer and um, so it's, it simply can't be good to, to maintain life in soil and, 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 and um, enhance soil organic matter and build up for instance. So conventional tillage has led to a number of problems through the years. Long-term production declined, and I observed that in the pastures region and the crop rotation um, systems, and organic matter reserves became depleted at about 0.2% um, carbon, which is almost nothing. 
The soils of the region is also very um, highly um, erodible, as indicated by the map. In, the, in all the regions, it's highly high or very highly erodible. And conventional tillage just it broke down the soil structure and um, just made this problem even worse. And then the soils are also prone to compact and, um, and to crust, uh, form crusts on the surface. And having low organic matter levels and no cover um, on the soil, it just made compaction and surface crusting um, worse. So by the 1990s, most farmers started to realize that they have to do something about this. And they converted to reduced tillage practices. And by the year 2000, most farmers in the region converted to, to these conservation agriculture systems. So soil quality improved through time. And soil quality involves the chemical, physical, and biological processes in the soil, um, but it, it's, it's not been doc documented until relatively recently. So what I'll discuss in this talk is benefits and problems, or select a few benefits and problems that I've selected, firstly in the dairy production region, the temperate region, and then in the dryland field cropping region. <coughs> so just to get, to get, get back to this, um, to the map, um, so the dairy production region is a temperate region with a relatively high rainfall. And this is a typical picture of what, what it looks like in the region. And most of the pastures are based on Kaikuyu, Benesitum clandestina, which is um, a, a summer producing pasture crop. And because the dairy cows need forage throughout the year, they usually over sow these pastures with rye grasses, which are winter producing and um, cool season grasses to have a steady fodder flow throughout the year. And they do this by means of a mulcher and a no-till or a minimum till seed drill, where they drill the seed into the pasture base. So they don't, there's not much short soil disturbance and they prefer planting the seeds into the mulch layer on top of the soil and not into the, into the soil. Towards, further towards the east, the rainfall is even higher, um, about 1,000 millimeters per year. And there you'll get um, pure rye grass pastures, annual and perennial rye grass. And um, in, in all the pastures, rye grass or kikuyu pastures, um, different uh, legumes, red and white clover, and sometimes lucerne is also oversown into the pastures with limited success. So this region, that small region in South Africa, makes a significant contribution to dairy production um, in, in, our, in our country. South Africa consumes more than 2.9 million tons of raw milk per year, which equates to about 1 billion US dollars annually. And 80% of South Africa's milk um, comes from, from pastures. And this trend towards increased production from pastures is even increasing more because it's it's more profitable than um, producing milk from um, feedlots and total mixed rations. So we, we, we tried to, to get the soil quality documented and um, we initially um, done a survey throughout the whole region on about 150 dairy farms where we, looked, where we compared the, the natural virgin soil, which remains historically undisturbed in the rangeland, Compared that to cultivated pasture. Cultivated pasture here is indicated in grey and the virgin soil in blue. And the stratification ratio gives us an indication of how skewed these parameters are towards the soil surface. In other words, how concentrated they are um, at the soil surface and how sharply they decrease as one moves down in, deep into the soil profile. And a, a stratification ratio of more than two usually indicates that it, um, it will, can have a significant impact on the farming practices and uh, so a, significantly uh, a significantly improved system. So for soil organic matter, soil organic carbon, microbial biomass carbon, total nitrogen and active carbon, we saw that the cultivated pasture soil, these minimum tillage pastures, improved the soil significantly or the stratification significantly um, uh, uh, through time. Um, potentially mineralizable nitrogen was um, very variable and we didn't uh, detect any, any significant differences. And this is, um, if I zoom into soil organic carbon, this is a, um, what it looks like as one moves down from the soil surface towards the two, 300 millimeters deep. One, and the, the gray line is the virgin soil and blue line the cultivated partial soil. One can see that 
the soil surface is much higher in organic carbon. Down at 300 millimeters deep, the cultivated partial soil has a significantly lower carbon content than that of the virgin soil, which is interesting and it would be interesting to see whether this trend continues as one moves deeper down into the soil profile and um, whether, it, whether the total organic carbon um, um, increases uh, in the whole soil profile is, is significant. In pictures, it, look, it looks like this. So the soil used to be to be like the soil a bit deeper down and it was conventionally tilled. There's very high organic matter in the top soil layers and clay soil and sandy soil have the same situation. In the sandy soil, for instance, if you want to move a bit deeper, then it, it can, the, at 300 millimeters deep one, and observe, well, it looks like pure beach, beach sand with no, no level, no, almost no organic carbon. So the minimum tillage had a, had a positive influence on certain physical characteristics of the soil and a negative influence on, on other physical characteristics of the soil. The minimum tillage improved water holding capacity significantly in all depth um, layers, um, and which is in, the increase is indicated by the dark blue part um, of the grey bar. And just to put that into perspective, in the top 100 millimetres, this, the virgin soil, uh, the cultivated partial soil, could hold an extra 104,000 liters of water per hectare, um, and the same for the, for, the, for the layers deeper down. And just that one can understand what it means is that that the soils that soil can hold an extra 25 millimeters of water um, back compared to that of virgin soil. And if you ask any farmer. In South Africa, 25 millimeters of rainfall is usually very valuable, and it just proves how, how in this organic increase in organic matter um, has a significant impact on the buffering capacity and the resilience um, of the soil. As I said, not all is good, and soil compaction in the cultivated partial soils are, um, is a challenge. In all depth layers, um, the partial soil had a higher penetration resistance for, um, the, compared to the soil in its original state. And um, so we had the same, same uh, we observed the same for bulk density. So the, the threshold for root penetration in conservation agriculture systems is usually argued to be a, about 2,000 kilopascals. And because of the biochannels and roots in conservation agriculture systems or, um, or, or reduced tillage systems, this um, threshold can be a bit higher. But it doesn't matter, even in the layer 200 to 300 millimeters deep, the soil was so compact or dense that it will certainly limit root penetration. And it's not, it's, that's not the, the characteristic of the soil in its natural state, so it's not supposed to be like that. <coughs> So because of the biological changes in the soil, um, especially in the topsoil layer, there are signi were significant changes in nutrient cycling and the chemical component of soil as well. Our fertilizer and lime guidelines in South Africa were developed in the 1960s, and this was done um, when the soil was still conventionally tilled. So these guidelines are still being followed today in conservation agriculture and, cons and um, and uh, cro uh, reduced tillage systems, even though um, the systems have changed significantly, especially at the soil surface. And there are certain pointers that these guidelines are not necessarily agronomical, agronomically or ecologically fit um, for today, and over-fertilization is a reality. I'll, um, I'll discuss Loading of soil with phosphorus and zinc, I'm only going to stand still by with two nutrients. And this is um, this, well, part of the work that was done by this, for the survey, 150 dairy farms, so it's the situation, the general situation throughout the, the whole region. It was divided into different um, uh, areas, the western, central and eastern area, and the Nikwa area, and compared to that of virgin soil, which is indicated by the dark um, bar at the bottom. And even 300 millimeters deep, phosphorus was increased significantly um, in all regions, um, 16 to 23 times higher um, in the topsoil layer than what, what it used to, to look like, um, depending on the region. 
you know, this can be either as a result of the fertilizer guidelines that are not being um, followed strictly by the laboratory services or farmers, which may, have uh, um, may be significant, but I, we don't really think so. And then, um, or, or irresponsible sales, sales driven advice to farmers where fertilizer reps simply want to sell what they um, their product and um, recommend um, that high levels of uh, phosphorus should be, should be fertilized. Or that these guidelines that were developed for conventional tillage systems are not appropriate for minimum tillage systems. For instance, the guideline says that phosphorus should be applied in winter at a rate of 20 kilograms regardless. In, the, in winter to stimulate root growth, regardless of what the soil tests say. And you will obviously have an increase in phosphorus through time then. For extractable zinc, the threshold for optimal plant production is more than one. And the natural um, content of um, the virgin soil is more than one So it's for zinc. And it should be um, fine for plant production. But zinc was 26 to 53 times higher in cultivated partial soil um, than in virgin soil, and this, this is even increasing through time. So this is a, as a result of fertilization and nutrient cycling from premixes and um, fed to in the dairy concentrates to um, prevent facial eczema and hoof problems. It may have adverse effects on the soil microbial activity, especially nitrogen denitrification and the nitrogen cycle. And it may also enter the food chain and transfer to meat and dairy products. So it is a, it is a, it is a problem which should, should be addressed. We also looked at the bi biology in the system um, and looked at microbial indicators and especially um, at how they are functioning. And we found that there was a higher functional diversity of soil microbial indicators in the cultivated partial soil, um, and that the abundance of the different microbial species were more equal in the cultivated partial soil. In other words, there was increased species dominance in the cultivated in the virgin soil, um, although it had a lower microbial biomass, total microbial biomass. Um, so one can say that these microbes in the virgin soil were less equally abundant, but they were more specialized. We also looked at um, soil disturbance and how this affects the biological quality of the soil. Um, there were five uh, tillage classes um, which increased according to the, the, well, the gradient of soil disturbance from absolutely no disturbance, pure kikuyu pasture, and minimum tillage where the ryegrass is oversown into the kikuyu base. Um, herbicide treatment where the, an annual pasture is established and the the previous crop or the volunteer crop was sprayed with, uh, with a herbicide. So there's a certain time period of the year where there's uh, nothing on the soil. And then shallow and deep conventional tillage. <coughs> and for soil organic matter, soil organic carbon, active carbon, total nitrogen, and a range of um, uh, um, enzymes, and these uh, effects were, were tested. And it's a lot of detail, so I'm not going to going to match the top, I just want to show trends or point out trends. The dark blue indicates the highest value within each row, and the light blue indicates a, a value that did not differ significantly from that of the highest value. So it's clear here that the, of these biological indicators, minimum, no disturbance, minimum disturbance, and shallow tillage had the highest values, except for acid phosphatase, which is usually secreted when phosphorus is not available um, or the conditions to take up phosphorus is not, not ideal. So sh there's an indication that, that shallow tillage, these soils are resilient enough to, to withstand the negative effects when the soil is sh um, tilled shallowly. But when there's a period where there's no, nothing on the soil, where the herbicides are used, it's not good. Right, so that's that for, for the pastures region. Now, moving back to the cropping region. Um, the crop rotation systems consist of small grain, um, wheat, oats and barley, and then also canola, a protein crop, um, cultivated in, in the Western Cape. They are cultivated, those are the, the, the cash crops, and then they are um, cultivated in a short rotation, 
with lupins and annual medics. And it can, a few of the common properties that they find, that you'll find there is wheat, canola, wheat, lupin, and then it goes back to wheat, canola, wheat, lupin. Medics, wheat, medics, canola, wheat, wheat, oats, canola. So it depends on the farmers, the farmers, the farmer which crop rotation he prefers. And that's especially true for, for the Swatland region where the rainfall distribution is poor. In the Southern Cape, um, it, you, there's also lucent, the rainfall distribution is a bit better, so there's a little bit of rain during summer. And this allows one, uh, the farmers to have a, bring a long rotation with lucent into the system. The five years lucent, wheat, wheat, canola, wheat, wheat, and then back to five years of lucent. And the forage component is mostly grazed by sheep. So sheep forms a significant um, part of these farming systems. It's medic for medics, lupins, and, um, and wheat, and then s sometimes a stubble as well. So the, the, this is a picture of what it looks like in the cool season during winter. Um, it's r um, gentle rolling hills, but, and it's a different picture. In summer, it's typical, typically what you'll find in the Mediterranean region. And just to put this into perspective, this gives a, the area harvested production and yield of the crops in the whole of South Africa. And then I've just indicated what the percentage um, of this is produced in the West Coast. <coughs> so, the 520,000 hectares of wheat is harvested, 1.8 million tons produced at 3.6 tons per hectare, and 63% is produced in the Western Cape province. For barley, um, mainly used for beer production, 84% is produced in the Western Cape, and canola is only produced in the Western Cape province. The, the yield of canola is still relatively low, so there's, there's room for improvement there. But just to, to stress what the conservation agriculture is all about, it's um, mainly of its focus on three, it stands on three legs, reduced tillage, residue or cover crop management, and crop rotations. And most farmers have adopted conservation agriculture, but they focus almost all of them focus on reduced tillage and then sometimes on, um, on well there's still work necessary to improve the cover crop management and crop rotations. So a long term study um, where different tillage systems was um, evaluated was done by the Western Cape Department of Agriculture it showed that in the Swartland region the active carbon and total carbon declined of only, after only five years of tillage. But in the southern Cape, where the distribution is better and organic matter is generally higher, there was no response in seven years. And it was once again an indication of what the beneficial effects of higher organic matter is and how resilient and uh, what the buffering capacity of the, um, of the soil is when the organic matter is, is higher. I can just mention as well that there's a similar situation where, with um, the, in, the, in the Parshas region with certification of nutrients. Fertilizer guidelines are not necessarily appropriate and we are currently busy re-evaluating nitrogen or we're starting with nitrogen um, to management um, in, this, in the conservation agriculture systems for wheat and canola and then we'll move on to the other crops as well. And also, we're also investigating a, or developing a strategic nitrogen fertilization program um, for pastures. Well, most farmers in this region use time openers to, to plant the soil, but it still disturbs the soil quite a bit as you can see there in the, in the photo. Our disc openers are used successfully in, in, the, in South America, and there's an interest to, um, to bring in disc openers in South Africa as well to reduce the effect of soil disturbance even more. With conservation agriculture, there's also higher levels of um, residue, and it became sort of became a problem with um, when during planting because it blocks or obstructs the planters when um, for times. But discs can usually cut through the um, the stubble and um, plant the seed more effectively. We hypothesize that will, the best plant opener will not be the same for good and poor quality soil 
and we, we are therefore evaluating this on, um, on, on, on different types of soil qualities to see whether, uh, which, whether discs or times will be most beneficial. Residue and cover crop management. Cover crops is a hot topic in South Africa. Um, we are currently, um, there's, there's not many, much research being done on cover crops until now. Because uh, the rainfall distribution is, uh, or the climate is a Mediterranean type climate, um, the residues deteriorate in summer because it's hot and um, there's, there's a need to, develop, to find crops that can um, either be used as a mulch layer on this, during the summer to protect the soil or a living cover crop um, which grows during summer. And um, Chloe um, McLaren, I'm not going to go into much detail, but she's doing a, um, investigating the resilience of agri-ecosystems to weeds. She'll conduct our pro the project in South Africa um, amongst other areas as well, where she investigates cover cropping and the effect that it may have on, on, on uh, wheat, weeds in the systems. And the ryegrass is, um, is a big problem in the wheat system because it cannot be controlled. Then I also have another student who um, is investigating utilization of this cover crops um, and especially what effect the, um, the utilization will have on the function of the, of the, of the cover crops. And he looks at where it's the cover crops are, are mulched and left on the soil or where it's been grazed partially um, and lastly where the silage, um, where, it's, where the material, part of the material is removed or silage or hay. And then just to summarize, and I really only touched on what, um, what, what's being done on soil quality in, this, in, this, in, in South Africa. And the research is, is published, so it's available, I can make it available if you, if you like. Most farmers con adopted conservation agriculture, and especially the reduced tillage part of it. Um, but soil changed through time. Biological soil quality generally improved, some physical properties improved, and others um, were, um, had a negative e effect, or the, the management had a negative effect on some physical properties such as soil compaction. And then chemical properties is also, um, there are some problems there, um, nutrient cycling changed, and it, it led to over, over fertilization. And then there's a need to look at new production, new and novel production systems as well, um, especially in terms of cover cropping, and also this um, this versus times, for instance. All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions for Peter? I'm interested in, in carbon sequestration. <laughs> I teach in the Chinese University, um, but I had a career in agriculture in Britain. And uh, I'm very impressed by a carbon farmer called Colin Zeiss in New South Wales. Um, he um, the farm's been in his family for three generations. Uh, if you listen to his story on YouTube, um, his father applied a lot of fertilizer, uh, potash, uh, potassium fertilizer, uh, sorry, phosphate, phosphate fertilizer. Um, and then the subsidy disappeared, and so he stopped completely. Uh, he's essentially a sheep farmer, um, but he seems to be an incredible carbon farmer. It's claimed that he's, um, a scientist working with him says that he's harvesting about 8.9 tonnes per hectare per year. When Lal, the, one of the famous uh, scientists in this area, suggests about a half is reasonable. <laughs> so he's got super fantastic carbon sequestration, um, which I think is politically important in the, in the context of climate change. Um, and having been a agriculture teacher for a long time, feeling that farmers find the best solutions and the scientists have to put the science behind it if they can. Mm -hmm. And what 
seems important is the symbiosis between the C4 and the C3 grasses mm -hmm. in that particular location. It's <coughs> a 30 degree latitude, which is not far from where you are, <laughs> um, where the, you're effectively harvesting the net physical radiation, the, the, the net physical productivity, the radiation that's coming down. You're harvesting the whole year because you've got the complementary uh, grass species. Um, and the important thing, I think, for this particular farmer is he, he can occasionally produce cereals by what he calls pasture cropping, which is with a, a, a disc, not a time, yeah. when, when they seed. So there's very little disturbance. Um, and he stopped using phosphate fertilizer. Those two things mean that the mycorrhizal fungi are very active. And I, it's my belief that there's a, the symbiosis between the, uh, the, C3, the C3 and the C4. You, you can have your, um, your legumes in, with the C3 plants in the winter time, and then the C4 plants can benefit through the mycorrhizal fungi in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is the science behind why this guy <laughs> can harvest so much carbon. Yeah. Anyone doing something similar in South Africa? Mm -hmm. Are we doing some ideas? <laughs> well, um, we um, we haven't looked at, at, at the mycorrhizal fungi yet. I think um, there is a there is a, um, a a carbon program where they um, I'm actually not not up to date on, on, the, on the exactly what it's all about, but where they can harvest carbon. Um, it's called the company that manages it's called C Four Solutions. And so they, they do, do do that, um, but it's not something that these farmers will do, and it's not very well known. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, and um, just to, to add to what you said as well, is um, I think the farmers are usually, they, they, they're in the field all the time, and they know exactly what's going on. Mm. And very often the scientist just needs to confirm what, 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 what they already see. And there's, there's one very prominent farmer in the Parshas region which says, you always say, when you increase the carbon in your soil, you can get away with murder. Because you, you can just, it's, your soil is so much more resilient and so much more, you can make management mistakes. But if your carbon content is high, it's okay. Then we'll, you know, your soil will just buffer that, that, that adverse effects as well. Um, I think. Something that's also important in our region is to diversify the, the pastures a bit more than we currently have. Um, the Kikuyu base is very highly uh, competitive, so that's why the, we don't re cannot really establish legumes very successfully into the system. And so they, they are there for a season or so and then they just disappear because we just too competitive. And recently, the farmers started to, to plant lucerne into the system. And, and although lucerne is perennial and it's, um, it, it stay, stay, stays in the system, it persists for about two years, which is short for lucerne. But the production outcompetes it all the, all the other normal conventional systems in that system. And although the Kikuyu is a summer producing crop and lucerne is also summer producing in our region, and the, the production was still higher than that of the of the conventional kikuyu rye systems, and then diversifying the the, the the systems will certainly also have an influence on soil health, soil quality, and and so that's something that needs needs a lot of work as well. Because I think in the partial systems we've 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 come to a, the, the threshold of where carbon can be built to. So. Doesn't, we don't really observe a further increase in, in the carbon in the, in the soil, even more. Thank you very much. I was just wondering if you're doing anything to 
had what we would call a, a water retentive landscape created in your, your areas. And that would maximise the benefit of whatever rainfall you're getting. Um, your know, this okay, so the lean dams and so on or yeah dams well mm. in the in the um well, they are usually they are dams, um, especially in the Porsche's region because it's um it's a irrigated region. So they either irrigate from dams, which is usually not in the in the in in the, the gullies because they you get all sorts of problems with sedimentation and so on. But what's interesting to, is in the in the in the cropping region, the government about three thirty years ago they. Um, subsidized and um, building of ridges or um, contours, and um, which is which was a great thing to prevent the erosion and it really helped quite a lot. But when the farmers converted to conventional uh, conservation agriculture practices, they um, they the planters couldn't plant on the ridges. And they don't like that because they want to plant more and they want to plant those ridges as well. And many of them started to, to level those ridges. And the government, they, 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 the, the farmers just say they, if they can prove that the, those ridges are still available, uh, are necessary, then they'll keep it, but they can't. So there's, they, there's, a, there's a big need to look at what the, how many ridges they, are all those ridges still necessary, or all those, everything still, still needs to be there. Um, yeah. I think we just have um, two more very short questions from the two people who already want to ask, and then we'd better close it for lunch. Okay. I'm Louise the Tampon from Ghana. And, um, I'm happy with the presentation. I'm looking at possibly um, what this study is feeding into at a national level or the local level, and I'm finding out whether there is a, a kind of a land use planning that this is feeding into and also whether uh, there is some form of uh, guidance to the farmers in the form of agri extension service. Yes, yeah, um, that's, that forms a strong part of this research as well. Um, we, we have this snag phrase called translational research. It's been done only to, to, um, to improve the profitability of the farm, of farming systems and um, so there's a there's a all of this right, research is translated to to layman's terms and it's published in um, newspapers. We all farmers days we we um, engage with the farmers and and have workshops. Um, we have a group of Mozambican farmers that comes to to South Africa annually where we train the farmers and for um, how to improve the soil and so on as well. So it's really important for us to to. Um, to get this information out to farmers and to, to um, build, build on, um, to, to, to improve their farming systems as well. And we have a big, a big component of that is, um, is uh, <coughs> upcoming farmers. Um, so this it's, it forms a big strong part. So it's published in, in, in Afrikaans and English um, in Raymond's terms, which, which we also give to the farmers. Any last question? Did you, sorry, did you have a quest, another question? Um, yeah. Ian, did you have a I, I was wondering, following on your earlier point, uh, if the farmers are removing contour bums, are they in fact planting crops on the contour? Yeah. And are they actually using the old bum spaces for their rotational cropping? So the different strips there? No, no, no it's, it's still usually the divided field. into camps. Yes. And then they'll, they'll, the whole camp will be one mm. crop, and the next year mm. it will be, be the next mm. crop. So it's how the, how the farms were divided according to. Mm. Yeah, it, the because my, my, my memory of American textbooks on contour cropping is the alternate bands, different crops, oh, which yeah. breaks the, yeah. the rainfall. And the yeah, no, usually they just plant the, yeah. the camp. So. Same as UK. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Please look at it.